This morning, we're going to try to start a series. And I actually think it's very, I think it's very timely. And I think it's very pertinent to, God, to where we even are, even right now in this very moment. It was hard. I was in Colorado this past week, and usually when I'm in Colorado, it's, it's not hard to write sermons because you're that much closer to Jesus. Um, and his nearness is so good, and those mountains are sweet, and coffee up there is just way better than down here, and especially when you guys are sweating in like 85 degree weather. But it was hard. It was hard. It was actually hard. I remember laying in bed with Chris one night, and I was just like, babe, I was like, I don't know. I'm stumped. My brain hurts. My heart's not focused. Like, I'm sitting there going, God, what do I need to do? God, what's going on? And, and then it dawned on me that my, my difficulty in speaking this morning, my difficulty in even writing this morning had nothing to do with a lack of words. It had to do with an abundance of things that I just wanted to scream at the top of my lungs and just throw a big old like spiritual Jesus fit up here and and because I just had so much stuff that I want to say and it's just and I couldn't focus it. It was like, no, we're gonna be here for five hours. That ain't gonna be good. I'll be tired of me by then. And I struggled. But at the same time, I'm like, but I've got to have the right thing to say, right? Like, I just come back. I'm fresh. I'm, I'm ready to go. And I need to have, like, the right thoughts and the right vision. I need to have the right mission. Like, I've been with Jesus. And, and I've been kind of putting all this pressure on myself to, like, come back and have the right words for you, right? And I got to this place of just going, we've got the right words already. We know what it is. We know what is most incredible for us. And so, I mean, I don't, I don't know how to state it any more simple and more sweet and more profound and to this idea of like, why are we doing what we're doing? What is it we're doing? How do we continue to move forward? And this was it. You ready for this? It's profound. You ready? Jesus is alive and he reigns. I, I, I couldn't figure anything else out. I was just like, he's alive and he reigns. And, and, and even more than that, you ready? Like it gets more profound. Here we go. You ready? Here it is. You're his people. You're a chosen people. He's filled you with the Holy Spirit. He's fueled you to be for his glory and for his renown. That's who we are. That's what we do. He is alive and he's reigning and he's ruling and he is sitting on his throne and he is operating in the hearts of his people. And he says, and you're mine, I've chosen you. You're my special people, I've called you, I've set you apart, you're mine. And I'm not gonna leave you by yourself, I'm gonna fill you up and I'm gonna fuel you and I'm gonna give you a mission. It's gonna be just to expose my glory to the ends of the earth. Just let as many people as you can know how good I am and that I reign above it all and that I am king and, and I can work and I will and I'll move in your life and I'll fill you up. Like, like that's it, that's, that's, that's it. Like I can't think of anything greater to prime our hearts than that. Maybe you've got something. I don't know. Let's go to coffee this week. But I can't think of anything greater to fuel my heart, to prime me to be everything that he's called me to be than to just be able to say, God, you're king. And your kingdom reigns above it all and nothing's going to get in the way of that. Nothing's going to thwart that. And God, you have chosen me out. I don't understand how you've done it. I, I, I don't know if it's that you just don't see what I see, but you've chosen me and you've called me apart. And now you've put your Holy Spirit in me and you've called me to this life of you. And like, can you imagine if you just got up and preached that to yourselves every stinking morning? It wouldn't be stinking. To get up and look in the mirror and just go, Jesus, you're king. And you reign. And I'm yours. And you fueled me for today. You fueled me for today. So let's go. Let's do this. Let's do it. Yes, Lord. It's what Robbie preached on last week. We put our yes on the table and say, here it is, God, and I can put that yes on the table. Why? Because you're king, and you reign, and I'm yours, and I'm filled up with you, and you've called me out, so let's go. Yes. I don't even know what he said 
for me to say yes to, but it doesn't matter because he's still king and he reigns and I'm his and I'm filled up and I'm fueled by him and it's go time. See how easy this message is? All I got to do is just keep repeating that. After everything that we say, I can just repeat that because that's it. Like that's it. That is our calling. So why would we not live like Paul called us to live in Ephesians 4? Where he says this, therefore, I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. The ESV says that I urge you, walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. Lead a life. Move. Go. Do. Live. Jesus, he's called you to that. So let's move in that direction. We move and we don't stop. We keep moving in the direction of living the life that this king has called us to. He rules. He's filled us up. He's fueled us. He said, now go be a part of my glory. Whatever you do, that's what you're going to do. Now just go. And we move. We, we move. We get going. That's what he calls us to do. Don't stop. There are things that we've been called to do because of who he is and because of what he's made us to be. Okay? He's king. He's made us his. Build us up. But here's the problem. You ready? Here's the caveat. You don't beg anybody and urge anybody to do anything unless there is some semblance of something in them happening that is not going to do that. I don't beg you to do something unless I sense that there's something in you that's going, I just, I don't know. And so you have to wonder, Paul is going, I'm begging you. I urge you, walk in a manner that's worthy. He doesn't say that unless there's people in his teaching audience that's going, I don't know. That's asking a lot. That's challenging some things that I believe that I don't know that I like. I beg you. I need to come up with some more sound reasoning as to why. I'm not there yet. But then let me urge you. I'm urging you to do this. Can I ask you a question? How in the world, okay? This is rhetorical because it's rhetorical. How did we get to the place? And, and I'm talking to me. Remember, I preach a lot like this. How did we get to the place where people chosen by the king who rules and reigns have to be begged and urged to walk with How did we get to the place where someone has to look at us and say, why did you stop moving? Why'd you stop? Why aren't you continuing to get forward? Why does he have to look at us and say, come on, let's go. You've got something worthy to live for. You've got something that's, that's good. Like you've got a life that's worthy of this calling. Like live it out. He's king. He rules. Hey, you're my king. You rule. So why do people have to urge me to keep going? How did we get to that place? Why do we have to be convinced that doing the right thing, to do the thing that God's called us to do, to be kingdom people, how do we get to this place where we have to be convinced that that is what's best for us? You ever thought about that? Just me? Okay. Now we probably think about that. When we go, man, I don't know that I want to go to church today. Why does somebody have to beg us to do that? I don't know why. I, I mean, I, I don't know how to talk to people. Why do we have to beg us to, to be disciple makers? Why? I have a theory. And here it is. You ready? Our perception is being or has been challenged. Our thought process, our thinking, our believing, our loving, our living 
all of that has been challenged. It's either being challenged right now, where in your mind right now you're going through enough stuff that it's challenged you to this place of going, I just don't know that I've got capacity to do that right now. Or it is something that has been challenged for a while now and you're just living in this place of just going, I don't know that I can really see. You see, here's the reality. Science, okay? Let, let's talk science for a minute. Let's talk like medical, like health. Tells us this, that when our... When, when we walk through difficulty, when we walk through hardship, when we walk through suffering, when we walk through like, like opportunities that disappoint us and frustrate us and cause us to go, I just don't like life right now. What it does is it fragments our brain and it keeps us from being able to focus on what truly matters. And I'm talking like little things. I'm not talking about going to bed and going, okay, five minutes ago, did I brush my teeth? <sighs> I mean, I didn't even think back that far. For me, they called it COVID brain. That's what they called it when I got out of the hospital. For six weeks, I fought through that. Had no idea what it was. They called it COVID brain. All I know is that for six weeks, I literally, I literally lived in an alternate reality in my head. Nothing made sense. I would come to my wife and I would say, Literally, is this real, what's happening right now? Is this real? I'd have conversations with best friends of mine. And I'd walk away and I would go, did that really happen like that? Why do these people hate me now? Couldn't figure it out. I didn't know how I was going to get back to a place of thinking right. My perception had been clouded. It was fragmented. I couldn't think straight. And that's the thing that Christ is calling us to do. And all of the difficulties and all the struggles that we're walking in right now, and y'all, we have come and we are post some really traumatic stuff that's happened to our almost entire world in the past two and a half years, and we're coming into a place now where we're seeing some of the ramifications of everything that's happened then, and we're seeing people now going, I don't know if I can walk with Jesus anymore. I don't know if I can go to church anymore. I don't know if I can love people anymore. I don't know if I can trust anybody anymore. Because our brains are having a hard time wrapping around what God has called us to do in Colossians 3, 1 and 2, where he says this, since you've been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on things above. Set your sights, ready for this? On the realities of heaven, on the realities of his kingdom, where Christ sits ruling and reigning in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. So let me ask you a question. If that is what it is that we're called to do, what is hijacking your perception to be able to do that? What's hijacking your ability to think? What's keeping you from seeing this incredible story of God that he has written you into in such a powerful way that you can no longer go, man, I am, I am one with him and I can walk with him and I'm a part of his story. What's keeping you from seeing that reality? What's keeping you from moving forward, advancing in this life as a follower of Jesus? What has you kind of feet stuck in the ground just going, I can't move right now. I don't know how to move right now. I can't, I can't take steps. What's keeping you from experiencing the best life in Jesus that you were created to have? And here's the, here's the crazy part. Like, yo, I'm not talking about like, like intro to Jesus believers. I'm talking about people who have been walking with Jesus for a while that are a place where they're questioning everything. So you're not immune from that. You can't walk through something and not think, man, how is this going to impact my ability to see and move what God is doing and being a part of that? So I got some thoughts. I just kind of wanted to throw them out there, maybe to see if some people kind of pick up on them that's, that's maybe hijacking your ability to think. Let me ask you a couple of them. One, is it, man, all of the stuff that's happening on the news and the social media that you just kind of are inundated with, right? I, I remember when all the news was coming out in COVID, like it just freaked people out. Even after they started lifting bands, people were like, nope, I'm never leaving my house. 
I'm never going to get back to that. Nope, never. I don't know, maybe it's politics for you. Like you're watching the polarization in politics right now and you're just like, man, I don't even know how to be an American right now. By the way, that's not the most important thing you could figure out. So is that? Let me ask you this. Is it your ongoing battle with just health and and the struggles that you're dealing with, maybe with you or someone else, and it's keeping you from seeing, man, this life as being good because all you can see is just sickness and death? And that's all you can see? I don't know. Maybe it's your ideal dream life that's not happening for you right now and you're just disappointed. Man, you had so much that you were supposed to be doing by now and you're not there and you just look at life and just go, man, this, this all is just disappointing. I thought I'd be way further along than this. And so we find ourselves kind of frozen. Maybe it's your marriage that's falling apart and you can't see any kind of hope for it. Maybe it's your constant battle with depression and anxiety that's clouding your perception. Maybe it's the temptation to do the same old thing over and over and over. It's the sin that you just can't get rid of and you want to and you've asked God enough times, God, I don't want to do this anymore and you just can't seem to get past it. So now you're just kind of frozen and you're just kind of going, okay, so what do I do now? Is it your constant battle with money, not having money? I've got too much money. I can help you with that one. (laughs) Are your desires for fleshly fleshly things blinding you to seeing what God wants you to move on to? Is it the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride and possession that we look to all the time? And it's just like, man, I want, 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 want. I want all of this stuff, and I need all of this stuff. And then here's the scary, the scary part. Is it the enemy who's working in every bit of that to steal your joy, to kill what God is wanting to do in you, to cause you not to be able to live in this best life? And the opposite of not living in the best life is living in this life that's frozen, not doing anything. I'm just standing here, and I'm just going to wait and figure it out. Because that's what the enemy wants to do. By the way, one of his strategies that we're called in Ephesians 6 to stand firm against is deception. It's deception. It's being deceived by the enemy. You know what deception is? It's taking a reality and putting just a little bit of of enough falsehood in it for you to go, ah, I don't know I can believe that anymore, and you see it totally different. That's what he does. So when we wake up and we go to our job in the morning, we're just like seeing it through these lenses that the enemy has put on us so that all we see is just brokenness and negativity and we don't know how to function in that. And our perception is skewed. Our perception is completely messed up. So what do we do? Let me just, let me just ask you a question. What do you do when you, when you start feeling that? We're talking natural here, Right? When things are AWOL, when things are chaos, what do we want? We want to get back to what feels good and whatever's quickest to get there. What do we want to say? What do we say in the middle of COVID? Man, I can't wait for everything just to be normal. I just want to be normal. Because we all had this life that was like, this was good. God was working, and now all of a sudden God's not there anymore because we can't go to church, we can't go to life group anymore, we're having to do this at home over like Skype and whatever else we can do, and so we're just like, man, I just need to get back to something that feels good. I need to get back to normal. I need to get back to a reality that I can go, yes, because we're frozen in everything else. So our perception is jacked up. Number two, we're reaching for anything that just feels good, feels right, feels normal, seemingly okay. So I began to ask God, it's like, God, man, what what do we cling to? Like, God, what's some scripture that we can kind of wrap our heads around and think through as we kind of process what this means and kind of hold on to? And man, like, boom, he just goes, he took me to Acts 17. He took me to Acts 17. Now, here's where we are in Acts 17. We're going to be here for the rest of our time. Paul is on his missionary journey and he's just traveling and he's sharing the good news and he's, and he's speaking about the gospel of Jesus that anybody can hear. He just came from Thessalonica and he had to get out of that town real quick because they were ready to, to have his head and so he's, he's, he's out of there and he finds himself in Athens, okay? So that's where we pick up. He's in Athens and he's kind of holding on and he's waiting. And so while he's in Athens and while he is waiting for the rest of his disciples to show up, he's just kind of perusing. 
He wants to kind of get a layout of the land. What's happening in Athens? So look with me in Acts 17, starting in verse 16. Listen to what he says. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply troubled by all of the idols he saw everywhere in the city. And hold on to things like that. Walking around and all I can see are idols. Things that they can call little gods. Things that they can cling to. Things that they can hold on to and say, man, this God makes me feel good at this time of the day. And this God makes me feel good at this time of the day. I mean, I'm struggling with this right now, so I need this God right now. So they've got all of these gods and he's looking around and you see them. He went to the synagogue to reason with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles. So people who kind of have some understanding, some religious thought. And he spoke daily in the public square to all who happened to be there. He also had a debate with some of the Epicureans and the Stoic philosophers. So he's got some people that are now showing up and like, man, they've got some thoughts uh, about what he's talking about. And that's what they do. He said, when he told them about Jesus and his resurrection, they said, what's this babbler trying to say with these strange ideas that he's picked up? Others said he seems to be preaching about some foreign gods. Now, what's interesting about this is they're not looking at this and going, I mean, you can get that stuff out of here. We don't need that stirring up our pots. We don't, we don't need that coming and, and, and added to our thinking. No, they're looking at it and going, huh, that sounds kind of cool. What is this that you speak of? Then they took him to the high council of the city. Come and tell us about this new teaching, they said. You are saying some rather strange things, and we want to know what it is all about. Now, I love verse 21. In mine, it's kind of in in parentheses like this, right? I I love it because it almost, when I read that, it's almost kind of like I read it as like, not, not snarky, but a little bit like kind of under the breath. It should be explained that all the Athenians as well as the foreigners in Athens seem to spend all their time discussing the latest ideas. Do you hear that? A bunch of people sitting around and in their mind they're thinking, we need to have everything we can on the table so that we can make sure that everything is here and everything in life is going to be okay because we've got everything covered. I I love it. Keep, Keep reading. So Paul, standing before the council, addressed them as follows. Ready? Men of Athens, I notice that you are very religious in every way. He doesn't slam them. Man, you guys are a bunch of morons. He's like, man, you guys are spiritual. You're thinking here in every way. For I was walking along, I saw your many shrines, and one of your altars had this inscription on it, to an unknown God. You know what I call that God? I call that God the FOMO God. It's the fear of missing out God. That makes sense? They're looking around and going, look at all this stuff. Look at all this stuff that I hold on to. Look at all these things that I have to wrap my arms around. All of these things that I can like cling to and find hope in. But you know what? I'm a little bit anxious. I'm a little bit worried because there might be one out there that I've missed. What happens if I've missed something? What happens if I don't have everything that I need? So they kind of created this God over here and said, you know what? We're just going to kind of hold on to him and we're just going to call him this, this, this God that just like covers everything else. The FOMO God. What's crazy is I think that's the problem with so many of us today. When life is hard, when things are difficult, when we don't know how to move forward, when we're stuck, when our walk with Jesus is struggling, when when our friendships are struggling, what do we do? We look for something to hold on to that's going to give us some kind of quick fix. We look for something that we can kind of wrap our arms around and go, this is what I need. Let me ask you some questions.
Maybe for you it's something like this or something a little bit different, but it's, man, my marriage has fallen apart. I need something to set my mind on. So, I mean, if we would just have a kid, or maybe if we just go buy a new house, then I don't have to think about how terrible my marriage is and how much that's fallen apart. Let me just get something over here, and I'll just hold on to that. Maybe for you, it's, man, my job is just not fulfilling me. You know what? I need another vacation. I just need to spend some time away from all of this. If I can just get away from all of this, then I don't have to think about how terrible my job is. Let me just, let me go away. Let me just set my mind on something else. Let me, let me wrap my arms around that. Let me cling to that a little bit more. Maybe for you, it's like, man, my spiritual life, it's just terrible. My spiritual life is broken. So what do we do? We go out and we try to find another Bible reading program. And so we, we run through like the YouVersion apps and we try to find our, our perfect thing. And here's the reality. Listen to me when I say this. There's nothing seemingly wrong with any of that. There's nothing wrong with having kids. There's nothing wrong with finding a new house. There's nothing wrong with going on vacations. There's nothing wrong with having a great app that'll help you walk through the Bible unless that is the very thing that you're clinging to to try to make your life make sense. That becomes your unknown God. That becomes your thing that you just go, man, I'm going to hold on to this because this is what's going to get me out of my rut. This is what's going to get me unstuck. This is what's going to get me moving again. And it might, but it also might for just a little while until you need another God to figure out. Until you need something else. So I love it. Paul comes in and he says, can I just help you with something? Can I, can I give you some wisdom and everything that you're talking about right now? Like you've got this unknown God. Listen to what he says. Here's the challenge. This God whom you worship without knowing is the one that I'm telling you about. In other words, you ready? Let me put it in a little bit different framework. That very thing that you're clinging to, if I could just have another job, another kid, another this, another that, that thing that you're reaching to to fill you up, what you're really wanting is the Jesus to fill you up that that's representing, that you're just not finding in the right person. You see, you want a new house. What you're really saying is, is I need... Jesus to do what he can do that I think this house is going to do. I need a new this. The God whom you worship without knowing is the one I'm telling you about. He is the God who made the world and everything in it. Since he is the Lord of heaven and earth, he doesn't live in man-made temples, and human hands can't serve his needs. He has no needs. He himself gives life and breath to everything. You ready for this? And he satisfies every need. Every need. So the need that you need scratched, that need that you need fixed, he goes, I got you. I need my marriage to be in somewhat of some kind of order. I need my marriage to start working. He goes, I got you. I need my job to be a job that I enjoy going to. He goes, let me help you. My spiritual life is miserable right now. Let me be the one to help you. Let me fix that need. Let me be the one that you cling to because I've got you. You don't need all this other stuff. All this other stuff is going to leave you frozen in your tracks trying to figure out how to find something else to make something better. And he's going, I am the better. I'm it. You don't need anything else. You got me. He satisfies every need. I don't think he satisfies mine, Dustin. I'm trying. I'm lonely. Ask him to satisfy it. I got sin in my life. I don't know how to conquer. Let him be the satisfaction of that sin. Let him have it. 
Listen, our every need is met in the person of Jesus. Listen to what he says in verse 26. From one man he created all the nations throughout the whole earth. He decides beforehand when they should rise and fall, and he determines their boundaries. So he is not unfamiliar with where you are right now, by the way. He's not unfamiliar with your circumstance. His purpose, ready for this, was for the nations to seek after God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him, though he's not far off. His purpose which was to create this longing for intimacy with him where we grope, we would claw ourselves through all of the muck, all of the mire, all of the frustration, all of the hardships, everything that we're needing, all this other stuff to satisfy and to fix, to dig through every bit of that and to draw near to him. And it's not like we're having to drag very far because he's not far from us. That's what he tells us. Our every need is met when we seek after God and we draw near to him. Why? Look at verse 28. For in him, okay? Not outside of him. In him, we live and move and exist. In him we live, in him we move, and in him we exist. In him we live, in him we move, and in him we have our identity. Why do you need Jesus? Why do you need to cling to him? Not as some religious brat does that, that, that's just comfortable with Jesus. But why do we need to grope and find our way near him? Why? Because in Jesus we have life. We have life to the full, actually. Not just a little bit of life, but an abundance of life. Life where when it's inside of us, it begins to well up and it becomes these springs of living water that literally gush out of us. But for some of you who are not walking, groping right now, your well is dry. And this idea of having any kind of life in him doesn't make sense. Because in him, there's life. In him, we know what to do. We move. If we're not in him, then we don't get to operate and walk in the wisdom of the Lord that says, this is what it looks like to walk in me. This is what it means to move. This is what it means to go. Think about the commands of the Lord. Go, be my disciples. Go, make disciples. Go, love me, love other people. You see, we don't know that if we're not in him. We don't have a map to move towards. We don't have direction to move in. We don't have momentum to get us moving because we're outside of him. And then finally he says in Jesus, we know who we are. I invite the band to come on up. We're gonna worship in just a second.